glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O hidden and exalted Lord Jesus Christ, you came down from heaven and dwelt in the womb of the Virgin Mary for our salvation. You visited John, your forerunner, while he was still in his mother's womb. In your mercy visit our souls and bodies, that we may praise you with purity and glorify you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Father's exalted Son, whose majesty fills the heavens, and whose goodness is poured out upon the earth. In his mercy he chose to be confined within Mary's pure womb, and he filled his forerunner John with the Holy Spirit. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast, and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. Glory to you, eternal Son, born of the Father before all ages. At the appointed time you became flesh of the Virgin Mary in a mysterious manner beyond our understanding. O King of kings and Savior of the world, you left the throne of your glory and became man. No mind can comprehend such humility, and no tongue can describe it. Your mother took you into the hills of Judea while you were yet within her womb. And there you met John, filling him with joy of your Holy Spirit. And then the hills were filled with joy and gladness. We implore you with the fragrance of this incense. And with the children and the angels we cry out, Glorify the Lord our God and praise him forever. Now with John we ask you to shower your mercy upon us, assist us with your strength, enlighten us by your teaching, and help us to know who you. Make us worthy with of our departed to stand at your right hand in your heavenly dwellings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
God of peace, you reconcile the heights and the depths. Now we ask you to accept the fragrance of our incense and establish peace among all the nations of the earth and among the children of your church. Extend the right hand of your mercy upon us and upon our departed, that we may glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> in the womb. Blessed are you, Holy Mary, and the fruit of your womb. Christ with holds on his mercy, showing that his love is true. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the holy ones who are in Ephesus faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and without blemish before him. In love, he destined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ, in accord with the favor of his, favor of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace that he granted us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption by his blood, the forgiveness of transgressions, in accord with the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, in accord with his favor that he set forth in him as a plan for the fullness of times. To sum up all things in Christ, in heaven and on earth. 
In him we were also chosen, destined in accord with the purpose of the one who accomplishes all things according to the intention of his will, so that we might exist for the praise of his glory, we who first hoped in Christ. In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, which is the first installment of our inheritance toward redemption as God's possession, to the praise of his glory. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Luke writes, And during those days Mary set out in haste and traveled to the hill country of Judea, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth had heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed are you who believed, that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. This is the truth, peace be with you. And how does this happen to me? In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. So this charming domestic episode that we have, which is filled profoundly with mysteries, the second joyful uh, mystery of the rosary, of course. Elizabeth's response is to say, how is this that this should happen to me? 
is the fact that she has received revelation that what this woman, her younger cousin, present in her house, brings with her is much more than just simply her personal presence. And she says, well, how should this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And of course, the child who's leaping in the womb, the child doing somersaults, whatever it may be, only mothers will know what that mystery is of how babies move and what they do and the activity of them. But we know it must be something because you call over your other little ones to put your head down, put your hand on the womb, to feel the baby moving. And John does something more than just move. This child leaps for joy because this child, six months old, recognizes the one for whom he came, the Christ. And so it's quite an extraordinary moment and it's a wonderful example of the integrity of the human person, we can say. Now, some of you will be familiar with the older translations that we have in the text of the scriptures where a hemorrhaging woman comes or someone's injured or someone's wounded and they're looking for a miraculous healing. And our Lord says to them, thy faith has made thee whole. Your faith has made you complete. This is the whole purpose of grace. This is the therapeutic healing that takes place by grace. Remember, salvation is not a moment. Salvation is a process of healing, of restoration, of reintegration. While we have to be zealous for the pursuit of virtue and desire is to become whole, of course, we must also not be unrealistic that our lives are usually going to be pretty much, hopefully, as the years go on, lesser and lesser, but always to be some degree out of whack, always to some degree of injuries that we carry until the day of our death. None of us will ever reach the perfection of God that is without limitation. We, well, sadly, regardless of what we may think, we have limitations. And in that woundedness, of course, the very fundamental axiom is to see, to judge, to act. It's very simple. There is only one human being that functions and acts. Only one human being that lives. None of us, not the Blessed Virgin Mary, none of us is more than one single person. Even our Lord is two natures. He is God and man. But there's only one person that operates. That is the divine word. What that means is that what in our lives has to be integrated means that the same person acts as the same person. You know, we talk in the gospel, our Lord uses the term hypocrite. Now the word has a great amount of innuendo and baggage to it of duplicity, lying essentially. But the word when our Lord is using it just means an actor. And what he's pointing out to us is that fragmented aspect of our lives so often in which we are one way and we act in another way. That's what breaks that axiom, see, judge, act. When we see clearly, when there's a luminosity of the mind, then we judge accordingly. And in judging, we act according to that judgment. You know, there's another axiom that we say that we must act the way we think or we shall think the way we act, one way or the other. Because there is only one person. And if I live like the pagans in the world, I shall begin to think like the pagans in the world. Now, no Catholics ever decided, I'm going to be a pagan. The fathers have always said, no one becomes evil overnight. It doesn't happen the same, it doesn't happen in that way. Yes, there are grave sins, yes, there are serious sins, but that doesn't make someone malicious or evil. It just means they screwed up big time. All right, we move on. But someone who actually acts in a certain fashion, not according to what has been in their mind, they either need to correct that and find the integration of their lives or they will soon justify mentally what they act as. That's why you've seen so many millions of Catholics just simply wander off. We live in a world which is filled with distractions nonstop. And so if we just ride that surf of distractions, it's inevitable that our minds, the inner person, will eventually be conformed to that reality. The reason why I say this axiom is an indication of seeing and judging 
enacting it because, of course, it's linked immediately with the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She whose spirit is of crystal lucidity, a lucidity and a clarity of thought and mind that we can't even possibly imagine because she is without sin. And the very first wound, other than the loss of grace and original sin, the first wound of original sin is ignorance of the mind. That's why it's hard to learn. Well, unless it's something we really like, and then we're motivated. But overall, the idea of retaining, learning, thinking, these things are skills that we have to be taught. And most children don't like to be in school. Most children do not want to do homework. Most children do not want to learn, prepare for a spelling bee. Most people don't want to do these things because there is a weakness in the human intellect that we call the wound of ignorance. It doesn't mean we're stupid. It just means it's hard for us to retain knowledge. But since the Blessed Virgin Mary is not affected by original sin, her mind has the original clarity that every human intellect was supposed to have. And in that clarity of thought, she sees brilliantly. She understands exactly what the angel Gabriel is saying to her. And therefore, the next step is to judge. And that's why she not just simply goes to see her cousin Elizabeth, she goes in haste to the mountains of Judea to see Elizabeth. She immediately judges, acting upon what she has seen with clarity. She judges then with strength. This is another reason why we have such great difficulty in making the choices of our morning prayers, our night prayers, our rosary, going to mass, whatever it may be, of trying to implement the gospel into our lives. The judgments are hard because a lot of people are smart and so they actually see if I make this judgment then I really do have to do this. I've had people like that over the decades who have gotten close to Catholicism I had one man once just tell me, he came in, he came in for his first meeting, that we were actually going to work on the catechism. And he was very, I was a young man, and he was very honest, and he said to me, I can't do this. And so when I asked him why, he had said, because I see where this is going to lead me. And he was very polite about it, and then walked out the door. I've always prayed for that individual, and hope that some point actually he would have found the integrity of that restoration to be made whole. But he was smart, very smart young man, who clearly saw where this was leading and he told me quite honestly that he did not want to change his life. So rather than acting, judging, and seeing, in seeing where this judgment and action was going to lead him, he chose immediately from the beginning not to see. And so when the Blessed Virgin goes, her action to go into Judea is with that strength of judgment. This is why we learn our catechisms. When our minds are not filled with Catholicism, I mean thinking as a Catholic, I don't mean you're thinking about religion all the time, but thinking as a Catholic, then our judgments are going to be that much weaker because we don't see it. And therefore the actions will just kind of perhaps happen, perhaps not happen, but it's okay. I had good intentions. That axiom, that cliche, well, she meant well, actually means nothing. All it means is she had enough information to know what the correct thing to do in her life was, and she didn't do it. That's actually a sign of condemnation, not an excuse. So the Blessed Virgin Mary, to see, judge, and act, is very clear in it. And what you see with Elizabeth is that clarity of thought by the revelation being given to her by that presence of the spirit of holiness within her. Why, how should this happen to me? Why should this happen to me? So in our lives, we see that ignorance that can be present, the weakness of the will, and therefore the actions that don't happen. This is why when we've tried to educate children to make them do things that are quote unquote Catholic, it never works. Because all we're doing is focusing upon the actions. And any kind of action that just simply makes someone do something ultimately becomes externalized. We'll get spanked otherwise. Why am I have to do this? Because otherwise you'll be grounded. You'll notice there's no link on judging and thinking. We haven't worked to actually touch their minds and have them see. 
That is, that is the drama of education, to be able to see. And as I mentioned weeks ago, in the education aspect, we cannot make them see things. We can only dispose the ground around them and try to have themselves see it. Otherwise, it's not actually learned. It doesn't mean you don't stop trying to teach. It just means that you understand what you're actually accomplishing. And this is why God never makes anyone holy. God never makes anyone be saved. Everyone is free. But he will dispose around us that ability to come to the knowledge by the grace and the arrival, as we've said often, the luminous eye of St. Ephraim, the ability to see. Because in seeing, then we have a clarity. We know what we are supposed to do. We judge correctly. And when that, the stronger that that clarity of vision is, the stronger the judgment will be. Unless, of course, it's weakened by just immorality, by cloudedness of bad actions usually sexual sins. Not because sex is the worst thing in the world, of course not. It's a conveyance of life, it's beautiful. But it does cloud the mind quite easily. It sets the individual on fire. It is the reason why Our Lady at Fatima said most people go to hell because of sins of impurity. Again, it's not because impurities are the worst, but they cloud our minds. It's why St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, whose feast day we celebrated last week, when he arrived to become the parish priest, the bishop of the city that he was living in, there were 18 Catholics in it, in the city. So you're actually doing better. We have more than 18 in Waterville, so we're doing okay, relatively speaking. Though, of course, many of you drive long distances to get here. And the reason why I bring up St. Gregory the Wonder Worker, not because he worked miracles, that's obvious in his name, but because what he did as teacher, as priest, as bishop among these people is he worked that the city itself would be less debauched, less sensual, less pagan in its revelries, if you like. Because he knew that as long as the debauchery was present, the mind was weakened to actually see the light of the gospel. And therefore he worked in a way, as one of the public figures in the city, to tampen down a bit the pagan revelry, the pagan sensuality, in order to allow those pagans then to actually hear the voice of God. And as a result, after 30, 40 years of working there, on his deathbed, it's quoted, on his deathbed he asked, how many pagans are still left in the city? And they said, well, Father, 17. And he said, thanks be to God. That is the number of Christians that we began with. That's why we know that he began with only a handful of people. But the city converted both by a pedagogical method to dispose the ground, and obviously by the grace of God, and with this specific man, a number of really quite extraordinary, exceptional miracles. One being moving a mountain, but that's a different story for another time. That is the importance of the clarity of thought. And so when you have your children and you teach, when we teach catechism, when we transmit the tradition of the apostolic faith, we are transmitting a light and the luminous eye to the next generation. And it must be with the clarity of thought, which is why as an individual becomes older, you explain why we do the things that we do. But of course, nemo dat quod non habit. You can't give what you don't have. And so if we ourselves don't know, then we can't communicate to the next generation what is that clarity of thought. And that has really been the tragedy of the last century of Catholicism. As we haven't had and we haven't given, judgments have collapsed and now we're just degenerating into paganism. It's all logically connected because there's only one human being that exists. It is either I as a whole human being who will enter into the kingdom, or it is I as a fragmented and broken individual who will descend into the bowels of hell. It, it's very simple. There's only two options here. So we either work for the therapeutic healing and the reintegration of our lives 
which is that fulfillment of healing of the mind and the will and the emotions and our physicality, our bodies, all being integrated as one single person. And we find that freedom. That's what our Lord means when he says the truth that sets you free. It is that reintegration of the human person by grace, therapeutically, as a process to make us whole, that makes us free. Because at that point, we're no longer slaves to the sin. Our Lord says that by which a man sins, he is slave to. Because we serve it, not the clarity of mind, not the judgment, not the action. We like the action because it's seductive. So we choose it, we steal, we lie, we go into immorality, impurities. We do it because it is seductive, having nothing to do with our judgment and our minds. And therefore we fragment and break ourselves apart. And we go back and we do these things again because they are seductive. And then we think we can't get out, which of course is not true. Read the confessions of St. Augustine. He talks about his habits. He talks about his attitude. Remember, he's famously the one who prayed for chastity, but not yet, because he couldn't imagine not living with a woman next to him. Obviously, he attained that freedom at some point. Read the confessions, because he talks about that what in the beginning had become a pleasure became the string that became the rope that became the cha chain, that went from something that was pleasurable, that became a habit, that became a necessity. And that necessity is the blindness of hell that locks us into it, that does not allow us to act otherwise. It corrupts us in action, therefore it degenerates us in judgment, and it corrupts our mind in our seeing. It makes us blind. So this reintegration of the whole thing is really what, when we look at the Blessed Virgin Mary, she is the restoration of the human person. She is the restoration of what mankind is supposed to be. And so on this day, we ask for her intercession, that she obtain first and foremost a desire of the clarity to know the apostolic faith, to know the faith so as to be able to see, so that in seeing, we ask that her intercession bring us that strength of judgment to make the choices that we need toward that freedom. And in doing so, then the next step, the final one, is the easiest, act. To see, to judge, and to act. Our actions become hard only because we don't really judge and we don't see. But if we see and we judge with clarity, then the actions just flow from us as second nature. And that's when the actions become virtuous because they become something that truly pours forth from us as our actions and not actions imposed upon us from the outside. So we ask this woman of freedom and liberty, this clarity of thought and strength of will, who is Mary of Nazareth, that she obtain for us these graces of the luminous eye and bring us full integrity so that on the day of our death, we should be able to hear from our word Thy faith has made thee whole. May her prayers be a rampart to us always. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Stephen the Younger. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
number of the 12 apostles on 754, 754. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice, and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith which is pleasing to God. and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure souls and holy bodies that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. Oh, 
Waxoya bil tarmida karamara Sabahula mene kulukhun Khunu denita Fagro adil Dahlo faikun wahlaf sagiyem Metak sayo metihab Khusuyon حومي وحيرا غلام علمين آمين خو كنا والكوس دم زخ ومن حمر ومن مهيو بارخ قادش Uya bel talmida karamara Sabishta o mehne kulukhun Khunu denita Demahu dila diya tiki khudato Dakhlo faikun wakhlaf sagiye Ete sharu meti heb Khusuyon Hawme wa khayyid al-qalam al-ameen Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup You do so in memory of me until I come again And we ask you to have mercy on your worshippers and to save your inheritance when you appear at the end of time, to reward all people justly according to their deeds. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you to have compassion on us, O God, have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved! For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Manin Murio, Nite Mororojo, Hayo Kodisho, Onachen Nalainu Alokurbono, Ono. Nanutain Abed Lahmono, Father Odom Shiho, Aloni Lan. O Lamzo Hoda Kosona di Modile, Dom Shiho, Aloni Lan. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your Church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, 
Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness, may they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, Stephen the Younger, and all the saints. Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest, hoping in you, awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are the Lord's, now and forever. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us. For yours is the kingdom, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo el Kuluchun. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries with purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gives for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy life, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
thank you, O Lord, who raised glory to you, for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Shlomo Elokuruchun. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, 
with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God to whom be glory forever. Amen.